that's too. I don't. I feel like I'm looking super washed out, super bright today. Like, what's happening? God, dollar silver. How? How, bro? Dollar silver every time. Like, how do you do it? You're always the first one in here. I don't know how you do it, bro. I don't understand. It's almost like nine o'clock every day. Dollar silver is like on my channels is waiting. He's like, is he gonna go live today? I don't know. I'm gonna just sit here and find out. <laughs> What is going on, beautiful people of the world? I see y'all piling up in here. What up, Roberto? What up, Blondie? What up, Brianna? What up, Allie? What up, Raven? What's going on, T. Wizzy? Ruben? What's going on? It's a bunch of y'all up in here. Already, already, beautiful people. Beautiful people, how y'all doing? I see we got some of my our members up in here. Christopher, Melvin, Libby. How y'all beautiful folks doing? What's up, Josie? How is y'all doing today? We got King Cole in the house. Yes, sir. We are in here. Wow, already 275 people. Y'all see what it is. This is Mr. Ballin. I wanted to give y'all this yesterday. I wanted to give y'all this yesterday, but as some of y'all know, I had a serious headache. A serious, serious headache last night, and it took me out. It took me out. Once my head got better, then... My body, my stomach was hurting or something. I don't know what the heck was going on with me. It was pretty bad. I had a rough night. Kermit, 420. My boy says he loves your videos. Shout out to your boy. Tell him thank you. Tell him I appreciate it. Lucky, lucky, welcome. Welcome to the fam. You know, join the team. We got a new member in the house. But y'all, y'all know what time it is, right? What up, A-OK -okay Mafia? It's your boy, Artie Kicks it just like that. We back with another one. All right, y'all, so I was just at Cracker Barrel with a few friends of mine. Shout out to my boy, Fernando. Shout out to my boy, Nick. We were hanging out, having a good time, and we were telling stories to each other, and I got to telling them some stories that I heard from the legend, the GOAT, Mr. Ball and himself, to the point where now, we was literally five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, in my car in the parking lot, pulled up here. I was playing a Mr. Ballin' video on the way home, driving back home from Cracker Barrel, sitting in my parking lot. They wanted to keep hearing the story. And <laughs> I was like, yo, Art, look, I already told you guys the outcome of this story. They're like, yo, but we want to hear it from his mouth. It's so good. So now they're, 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 they're fans. I'm, I'm about to say friends. They're fans of Mr. Ballin now. But again, shout out to Fernando and Nick. They came through today. They were a major, major help. Your boy was trying to get his inventory in order for what merchandise that I currently have left on the shelf. Because I have some new stuff coming in and I need to organize what I have. So I make sure everything is you know, good to go. Um, so luckily, there's some stuff that I have that are available on the website. The Ghost of Real shirts that look like they were sold out. I actually got a few available in each different size. Those are available on the website. Hey, hold on. Fernando made a whole inventory list. So I can tell you some of the, guys, some of the stuff that's here. So we got the... The No Mama's Way shirts, those are actually available. Those shows sold out. The Nope Not Me's, the, uh, like I said, the, the Karen shirts, those are some of those are available. All kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff is actually available on the website. And I will be shouting out you guys um, towards the end of the live stream that are going to hop on the website and cop stuff during today's show. So, yeah, I just want to give you guys an update. We got 400 something people in here. We're about to get this party started, but we got a few. Uh, streams up in here a few chats a few don't knows on came through Jessica Knight shout out to you and I've seen you in here before one will what's going on I thank you for the $20 donation Miss Max thank you so much thanks for being you thank you for being you sweetheart we got some new members as well Marcy what's going on with you welcome to the fam Miss Max oh just hey it was just you yeah welcome to the fam T-Bird, welcome. Welcome, my new members. Thank you guys so much. We're about to get this party started. We done got a good amount of people in here. We're about to approach the five-minute mark, so let's go ahead and check out this video. Like I said, I've been, I've been hyping Mr. Balling up today to some of my friends, and now I'm ready to sit here and watch some myself. This first video that we're going to check out, we're going to do only two tonight. Just do two. Uh, we got tomorrow's live stream. I don't want to spoil that too much. You know, we got to do that. But uh, this is top three impossible places people were found missing. 411, part 18. I don't think we've done this video yet. I hope not. My videos be running together sometime. Let's get into this. Every year, hundreds of people go missing under baffling conditions in the woods of North America. 
I'm talking about people that are right in front of someone and then in an instant they're just gone and yeah. they're never found again. Yeah. Or in some cases they are found again, but they're in places that are impossible to access. Right. One former police detective named David Politis has investigated thousands of these strange disappearances and he documents what he finds in his incredible book series called Missing 411. Mm. Today, we're gonna look at three of his strangest Missing 411 cases. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please give the like button <laughs> VIP access to the King to Ka roller coaster at Six Flags Great Adventure, New Jersey. And once the like button gets to the top of the ride, go ahead and manually turn off the ride and then close the park. Oh no. Also please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Give me the story. Uh. What did the dog see? On May 21st, 1941, Betty Albright and her three-year-old son, Eldridge, traveled to her mother's house in rural Woodstock, Maryland. Betty had asked her mother if she would look after her son for the afternoon so Betty could catch up on some much needed sleep. They arrived at Betty's mother's house at about 1.30 and right away, Betty went inside, handed her son to her mom and went upstairs to take a nap. As for Eldridge and his grandmother, they went out in the backyard to play. Now, Eldridge loved going to his granny's house because she had this enormous backyard for him to play in. If you were standing on her back porch looking out, it would be 250 meters of just open grass for him to run around in, and it butted up against this huge forest. And in the middle of her property, looking straight out at the forest, there was this three meter gap in the trees that if you walked through it, it would bring you down to this creek bed that was seasonal, and there was very rarely any water running through it. From the porch, anyone that was standing in this creek bed, you could clearly see. And so Eldridge was allowed to play in the creek bed, so long as he didn't go right or left in the creek, which would put him out of view from anybody on the porch. And so this particular day, when Eldridge and his grandmother went outside, Eldridge wanted to go play in the creek bed. So he immediately starts running across the yard towards it, along with his grandmother's three dogs. As for his grandmother, she just didn't have it in her to go all the way down to the creek bed. So she decided she would just sit on the porch and read a book and keep her eye on Eldridge. Okay. She remembers watching her grandson go all the way across the yard get to the break in the trees, and then step down into the creek bed where he began goofing around with the dogs and throwing rocks and having a good time, clearly in view. And for the next five, 10 minutes, she just stared directly at her grandson and the dogs. And at some point she picked up the book next to her and she began reading the book and then periodically looking up to check on her grandson and then back down to the book. At about 2 p.m. she was looking down at her book when she heard her grandson yell out for help. Now, three-year-olds yell out for help all the time. Sometimes it's a big deal, and sometimes it's not such a big deal. But oftentimes, the sound of their voice gives away how serious it is. No matter what they say, it's like their tone gives away, should I take this seriously, or is this just a kid being a three-year-old? And she would say that the way he was yelling sounded like a real emergency. When she poked her head up, even though she had seen him you know, less than a minute ago playing in the gap in the trees, now she's looking and he and the dogs are gone. And so of course she's alarmed. She hops out of her seat, she goes down the steps and she starts walking across the yard towards Eldridge. And she's yelling his name and she's walking quickly. When she got about halfway across the yard, she heard Eldridge yell out again, except this time his voice was coming from way off in the forest, way farther away from the last time he had yelled out. It gave the impression to her that he had moved a great distance from the last time he yelled to her. And it triggered something inside of her that was telling her something is terribly wrong. And she began running towards the creek bed, still no sign of the dogs. She can't see anything. She's just running towards the creek bed. When she gets about 10 meters away from the break in the trees, she hears her grandson yell out for a third time, barely audible, way off in the forest. He yells out for help, and as he's yelling, it sounds like someone has stifled him and covered his mouth mid-yell. So she runs through the break in the trees down to the creek bed where she stops, and she looks out in front of her, and it's just dense forest, and there's no eldridge, there's no dogs, there's nothing. She looks to her right down the creek bed, and there's nothing down there, and then she looks to her left, and one of her dogs is in the creek bed, maybe 10 meters away, facing away from her, and the dog is positioned in... Man, one thing, man, I gotta say, Mr. Ballin, where the heck do you be getting these photos from, man? They do such a great job of piecing the stories together. 
freaking dog in the creek bed like this? What the freak, man? Where you get these pictures from? What stock photo website are you using? And how much you pay? <laughs> Such a way that it's clearly looking at something. And so she runs down to the dog thinking she's going to see maybe Eldridge or the other dogs, but there's nothing beyond the dog. The dog is just rooted to the spot. Its hair is raised, it's growling, and it's taking little steps back, like it's been spooked at whatever it's seen or whatever it's looking at. And she just looked up and tried to look in the direction the dog was looking, but there was nothing, it was just forest. And so at this point, she felt certain that someone must have abducted Eldridge. And so she turns, she tries to pull the dog to come with her, but the dog's not budging. And so she runs back to the house to wake up Eldridge's mother. The two of them come back down to the creek bed. The dog is still in the same position, growling and staring in the same direction as if whatever it's looking at hasn't gone anywhere. And they look for a couple more minutes. They're yelling for Eldridge. And the grandmother is telling her daughter, look, I think he's been abducted. We gotta call the authorities. And finally she relents. And so they do manage to get the dog. They run back to the house and they call the police. Shortly thereafter, the state police showed up with this huge contingent of searchers. And they immediately went down to the creek bed where they started pushing predominantly to the left side, which is where the dog was angled. And it was also where the grandmother had heard her grandson yelling from. And very quickly, police discover some of Eldridge's footprints about 50 meters down on the left side of the creek bed. They were in some sand right at the edge and they were walking away as if he was leaving the area he had been told to stay in, which was in that gap in the trees. But interestingly, the footprints, it looked like he had been walking for maybe 20 or 30 meters when inexplicably the prints just stop as if he stopped in the sand where he was. But had he gone right, left, straight, turned around, had he gone in any direction, there would have been additional prints in the sand, but there wasn't, which gave the impression that was where someone must have lifted him up and kidnapped him. But they never found any prints connected to a kidnapper. For the rest of the day and that night, they would not find any more signs of Eldridge or the other two missing dogs. The next day, about 24 hours after Eldridge had gone missing, there were a number of search crews that had gone well outside of the primary search area in hopes of maybe finding one of the two lost dogs because they thought maybe they could bring them to the lost child. And this one crew that was four miles away from where Eldridge had gone missing, they were walking past a swamp when one of them heard what sounded like a child whimpering and it was coming from inside the swamp. And so immediately they turn and start walking into the swamp, which had fairly deep water, and they get to this clearing and they see there's this rocky overhang with high grass all around it, kind of forming like a cave. And they hear this whimpering again, and it's coming from underneath that rock. And they rush over and they're pulling the grass aside, and sure enough, tucked underneath this rock, inside of this kind of makeshift cave, is Eldridge. He was laying on this really well-constructed bed of leaves that looked like an animal's den. So either Eldridge had found an animal's den or he had built himself this beautiful bed of leaves. When they approached him, he was sleeping underneath this rock. And so that whimpering sound he was making, he must have been making in his sleep. And so as they got closer to him, he woke up and he kind of sat up and he's very groggy and confused. You know, all of his clothes were really badly torn up and he wasn't wearing any shoes, but he overall seemed okay. He just was very confused seeming. And so they scooped him up and they brought him back to search headquarters, reunited him with his mother and his grandmother, and everyone's just so relieved that he's alive. But at the same time, people were like, how did he get four miles away in the middle of a swamp? And so after the doctor cleared him, saying he was okay besides some scratches and bruises, the police, along with the mother and the grandmother, sat down with Eldridge and asked him, you know, what happened? But unfortunately, Eldridge appeared to not know this had even happened. He didn't even know what? he had spent 24 hours out in the middle of the woods by himself. It was like... He was out there for 24 hours? What? He don't even know. Look, something... Y'all, aliens... Aliens got to be up to this stuff, man. This was, I was just thinking about the story of the boy that was like playing in the in the backyard with the dog at the little fa family gathering and then the father was looking for the boy. Remember the story that Mr. Ballin told? And every person that the father asked said that the dog the boy was playing with the dog over there. And then it was the same sort of thing like they found the boy like past the swamp holding on to this tree that was on this little patch of land and people had to go through the swamp to get to him, which was deep enough to go over the kid's head, but the kid was not wet. No mud, no anything. Like, 
how did that kid get placed there so many miles away from his home or the home that it was at? Aliens, man. They got to be abducting these people and dropping them off in weird places. I don't know how what the freak is going on, man. It'd be weird, man. He had blacked the whole thing out. Because Eldridge was found alive and unharmed, the police did not continue to investigate this case. Why not? And so we don't know what caused him to suddenly be yelling for help and appear to be drifting farther and farther into the woods. We don't know what the dog saw in the creek that scared it so badly. We don't know how Eldridge moved four miles through a dense forest over multiple swamps only to wind up in yet another swamp inside of a cave. Although the police came out and said Eldridge must have just wandered off on his own, nah. basically everybody involved in this case. Hold on, I think I found one of them little things in Mr. Ballin's videos. Came out and said Eldridge must have just wandered. I can't make out what that is down here. Wandered off on his own, basically oh. everybody involved in this case believes someone or something abducted him. It's just very fortunate he was found alive. Unfortunately, there's no clarification about what happened to the other two dogs, although the way it's worded in the story, it does sound like they were never found. What the freak of nature? They couldn't even find dogs? In the 1950s, the Thorpe family lived in Dunbar, Pennsylvania, which was a small town of less than 1,000 people. Okay. Their house was on a very quiet street with very few neighbors anywhere near them, and their property was right up against this forest that was right in their backyard. Their daughter, two-year-old Anna, loved to play in their backyard, but she was instructed to stay on the grass section of their backyard and not venture into the forest because the forest was snake infested. And Anna was terrified of snakes, and so she happily obliged. On May 5th, 1950, Anna was playing in her backyard in that grassy section, and her mother was in the kitchen looking out the back window into the backyard, and her mother looked down for a second when she heard her daughter scream. She looked up and Anna was gone. She immediately ran outside and she's yelling for her daughter. She's looking all around and she knows she must have gone into the forest and she's thinking to herself, she must have been bit by a snake and she's laying on the ground somewhere. That's why I can't see her. And so she runs into the forest and she's screaming for her daughter and she's not getting any response. She's starting to panic. All her yelling has gotten the attention of her two older sons that were in the house. They come running outside and they join the search and they start fanning out and they're looking for Anna and she's just gone. And so after only a few minutes of looking, Anna's mother decides she has to call the police. The police show up and they launch this massive search and word got out to the residents of Dunbar that one of their own had gone missing, a child no less. And so virtually everyone in Dunbar showed up to be wow. a part of the search and they combed that whole forest behind their property and there was just no sign of Anna. After the first 24 hours had gone by and they had not found any sign of Anna, they decided to expand the search area from a one mile radius to a three mile radius. And within just hours of this change, there was a crew that was three miles away from where Anna had gone missing and they found Anna and she was alive. She was laying under this blackberry bush. All she had on was a single shoe. Next to her was a pile of clothes. When they went up to her, she seemed okay. They picked her up and they brought her back to the search headquarters where they reunited her with her parents. A doctor looked at her and the doctor said, you know, there's no signs that she was attacked. There's really no signs of any wear and tear on her at all. It doesn't even look like she was outside for the past 24 hours. When Anna was asked about what happened to her, she wasn't able to give any sort of meaningful answer because she's only two years old. But the reason this case is included in today's video is not because, you know, she vanished mysteriously in the forest, and that she was actually found three miles away versus one, or you know that she was found with just a shoe on. The reason it's included in today's video is because for her to have been found where she was found, the only way, the only way for her to have arrived at that spot was if she crossed 10 barbed wire fences. There was no other way for her to have gotten there. The only other way would have been a massive detour that she literally could not have covered. And it don't what I tell y'all? Woo! We got 1,300 people in here. Last time I looked, it was like five, 600, something like that. what I tell y'all? Aliens. Aliens. This girl was picked up and dropped off. Didn't it look like she'd been outside? You know why it don't look like she'd been outside for 24 hours? Because she wasn't outside for 24 hours. She was in a whole spaceship. She was in a whole spaceship. Too young. She's too young to be able to tell the story of what happened to her. You know what's crazy? I was on TikTok earlier. I was watching something about aliens. 
And then I went on TikTok and the first thing that popped up was this attractive Hispanic girl talking about, she's like, all right, now that it's like two weeks or a few weeks away before these, these U.S. documents or whatever being released about aliens, now let me tell my story. And she told two stories of alien encounters that she had when she was a child, like very, very, very young. And she remembered them and she told them with such detail. I'm like, all right, she might have been adopted for real. She had no reason to lie. It was a pretty Spanish girl. I don't know. It was weird. Oh, probably couldn't have covered in the amount of time given. So this two-year-old with no scratches on her body is found on the other side of 10 barbed wire fences. Crazy. I mean, even if you take the barbed wire off of the fence, a two-year-old climbing a large fence, that alone is kind of a Herculean task. And to do it without scratching your body, it's 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 not possible. It's truly impossible. Right. A May 7th article in the LA Times said the police were baffled by this 10 fence dilemma. And they said the only way it would make sense is if she had been abducted and dumped there. But the police also repeatedly said there was no evidence to suggest she had been abducted or attacked or harmed in any way. It was just where she was found did not add up. Ultimately, the police came out with a statement saying this had to have been an accident, that Anna, the two-year-old, managed to just somehow walk her way past all these There's fences no way. and was found where she was, and thank goodness she's alive. But interestingly, the police confiscated her clothing and would not give that back to the parents, indicating there was further investigation happening even though the child had been found. But unfortunately, the police never revealed whether or not they actually discovered anything else about this case. And like in the Eldridge case, Anna's parents did not press for more information about what happened to their daughter wow. because she was found alive and unharmed. Now, Anna's case might seem like some crazy anomaly, and that's all it is. But this is not the first time something like this has happened in this small area in Pennsylvania. Two years earlier and less than 10 miles away from where Anna... Well, let me, let me, hold on. Before we go any further, let's kind of make a mental note of that about the parents not wanting to investigate any further into what could have happened to their child. That all, that also makes me think that if this was alien that did this, then it's a strong possibility that they targeted that family and that child for a reason, knowing that that family wouldn't be the type of people to want to look further into what's going on. This is interesting. Very, very interesting. Giovanna, thank you for becoming a member. Anna went missing. Another two-year-old, Ronald Collier, also went missing in the same stretch of woods. His mother had been sitting with him on their back porch, which overlooked the same forest. And at some point, his mother had gone inside, leaving Ronald sitting on one of the seats. When she came back out again, Ronald was gone. His mother estimated that she was inside for maybe 10 or 15 seconds tops. The police and the community came out in force and they combed through the woods and they could not find any sign of Ronald. And the police got really frustrated with Ronald's parents because they felt like this is impossible. How could this child not turn up considering the timeline you've given us, which is you went inside for 10, 15 seconds and your son is now completely gone. He's completely vanished. Like you must have something to do with this. Right. And so the police made Ronald's parents take polygraph tests and his parents passed all of them. The search for Ronald continued for several weeks, but unfortunately it was ultimately terminated and they never found him. People in the area believe someone or something, maybe a bear or some other animal was lurking in the tree line and watching Ronald. And as soon as his mother went in the house, they ran up and snatched the child and ran away with him. However, the police came out and said there was no evidence to back up that this child had been kidnapped that what's far more likely is Ronald just got up and walked away and disappeared. However, two years later, when Anna's case happened, the similarities between her case and Ronald's case were just too much for locals to overlook. And so people began saying, you know, it looks like Anna was abducted and placed where she was ultimately found inside of those woods. And so probably whoever or whatever took Anna is the same person or thing that took Ronald but Anna was just lucky enough to survive. Although this mystery predator theory is just that, a theory, it does seem more likely than Ronald in 15 seconds getting up and running off into oblivion, never to be found again, and Anna scaling 10 barbed wire fences in a 24 hour period without a scratch on her body. Unfortunately though, we'll probably never know the truth. 
Wow. Wow. Shout out to TV. What's going on, woman? Thank you for coming a member. We got some new members in here, baby. In September of 2004, 49-year-old Robert Springfield, along with his two teenage sons, left their home in Wyoming, bound for the Bighorn Mountains in Montana. They were planning to do some elk hunting on the Crow Reservation, which is the homeland of the Crow tribe, and Robert and his family were members of the Crow Reservation and therefore had the rights to hunt on that land. The specific spot the boys were going to be hunting was Black Canyon, a particularly steep and rugged area. But Robert was well equipped for this type of environment because he had previously served in the United States Marine Corps in their Special Operations Unit, which would have meant he would have received a very high level of outdoor survival training, which is perfect for living up in the mountains. Robert's sons had apparently learned a lot from him and were very competent outdoorsmen as well. They arrived at the reserve on September 19th and immediately headed out to do some bow and arrow hunting. Their plan was the two boys would break off from their father and head over to the edge of the canyon and attempt to drive elk down into the valley so their dad could take a shot at them. But late in the afternoon, the two teenage boys had not seen a single elk and so it was getting to be time to head back to the prearranged meeting spot and so they packed up their stuff and they headed there. The boys make it to the meeting area and their father, Robert, is not there. So they sit down and they begin to wait. And an hour goes by, two hours goes by, three hours goes by, still no sign of their dad. They can't get in touch with them. They have no cell phone service. And so they're thinking to themselves, okay, you know, worst case scenario, he got turned around and he'll have to spend the night out in the cold, but he's got warm winter clothes on. He knows what he's doing, he'll be fine. And so as the sun was setting, the boys did finally leave to go tell authorities that their dad was, you know, lost in Black Canyon somewhere, but it was just not registering for them that this could be life-threatening, that something really bad could have happened to their dad. He was just the Superman figure to them and it just did not cross their mind. Authorities launch a search that night that includes the use of helicopters with thermal imagers doing low flyovers of the entirety of Black Canyon. Thermal imagers pick up a heat signature, and so anyone that is alive gives off a heat signature. And so at night, if you were flying overhead and you saw a person in the middle of a canyon where there's virtually nothing else around them, they would stand out like a bright light. Yep. But that night, the helicopters combed all over Black Canyon, and they never saw Robert. However, authorities would say that, you know, this guy, he's trained, you know, former special operator, he probably went and found shelter. So he could be inside of a cave or maybe he made himself a shelter with tree branches and it's obscuring him from the thermal imager. And so we'll just have to look tomorrow. But the next day, despite bringing out hundreds of searchers and bloodhounds and people on horseback and more helicopters and planes flying overhead, there was no sign of Robert. Wow. After several weeks of still not finding any sign of Robert. Several weeks? What in the world? It's the legs. I'm doing well. How you doing, brother? They ultimately called it off. The family was obviously crushed, but more than that, they were just dumbfounded. The idea that something bad had happened to invincible Robert, that just didn't add up for them. And so after the official search was terminated, they would continue to make trips into Black Canyon looking for their father, their husband. But unfortunately, like all the searchers, they never found any trace of him and eventually accepted that he was gone. One year later, in October of 2005, a hunter who didn't know anything about Robert Springfield or the fact that he had disappeared, this hunter is in Black Canyon in the same area where Robert Springfield had disappeared. And this hunter is walking through this really dense forest Pitch black. He's all alone. He's an experienced hunter and he's not on a path. He's just kind of combing through the woods and he starts to hear what sounds like a crow screeching. And at first it doesn't really register with him. It's only in retrospect that he recalls this sequence of events. As he kept walking on, the screeching intensified to the point where he just could not ignore it. And so he stopped and turned to listen to the screeching crow that he couldn't see through the dense forest, but he could tell it was in that general direction. This hunter said as soon as he stopped and he turned and began actively listening to this crow, he had this weird sensation that the crow was trying to actively communicate with him. It was a very strange experience. He had never had anything like it in his entire hunting career. And he spent lots of time outdoors. And so he felt like he had to go over and see what was going on with this crow. And so he starts walking towards the crow. He still can't see it. It's very thick vegetation and he's getting closer and closer and he gets to a place where he can just barely see this crow. It's in a clearing. There is this large tree stump right in the middle of the- That is so fascinating. This hunter 
has this sense of urgency to want to pay attention to what this crow is doing as if the crow is talking to him or trying to get his attention. He can't even see the crow. I, my black eye wouldn't have paid that crow no attention. I would have just, eh, eh, I was like, dang, hear that crow just won't shut up. Golly, I'm trying to hunt this deer over here. I wouldn't have paid that crow no attention. That's crazy. The clearing, and this tree stump is not short. It's like six, seven, eight feet high in the air. It looks like this tree had broken in the middle and fallen over, and this crow is sitting on the top of this kind of gnarled stump. And the crow is just incessantly screeching. And from this hunter's perspective, he can see the crow and he's kind of staring at it. And as the hunter is looking at this crow, the crow suddenly turns and looks directly at the hunter. And it recognizes the hunter can see the crow and the crow stops screeching and is just staring directly at the hunter. And this hunter would say he felt so unsettled by the sudden behavior of the crow because it was almost like confirming the crow was looking for him. And now he had found him and he stopped screeching and was looking at him. The bird continued to stare silently at the hunter to the point where the hunter felt compelled to walk out of the vegetation into the clearing to kind of confront the crow. And so he stepped into the clearing and the crow the whole time is not screeching anymore, just looking at the hunter. And the hunter's standing in the clearing and he looks at the crow and the crow suddenly looks straight down. The hunter follows the crow's gaze down to the ground and he sees at the base of the tree is a human skull. And the hunter's so taken aback by this, he looks back up at the crow who's looking at him again. And the whole situation is so terrifying to this hunter that he just makes a note of where he is and he runs. As soon as the hunter got out of the woods and was back in cell phone reception, he called authorities, authorities showed up and he showed them on the map where he had discovered this crow and the skull next to a tree. And sure enough, the authorities make their way out and they find the skull right under this tree. The crow at this point is gone. When they walked up to the tree stump, what the freak? Is this a real story? This is mind blowing. This is absolutely mind blowing. What up, Miss Silver? Good to see you in here. He says, hey, thanks for my gear. Been rocking my Karen hoodie and my that's cap. That's what's up. I'm glad you like it. And you're welcome. Yo, we got some new members in here. Mr. Luristic. What's this, Margaret? Thank you. Your boy, welcome. We got new members, baby. Welcome to the family, y'all. This story is something else. And shout out to everybody that's on the website copying merch. Like I said, I got some restocks of uh, some merch available. We did an inventory check, and just about everything is in stock. Very, very limited quantity, though. But, um, wow. This seems like something out of a movie. They discovered it was not just a human skull, it was also a human femur bone right next to the skull. And then next to that was a set of boots that had been placed right next to them, neatly next to one another. And then next to that was a belt that had been tightly wound up and placed next to the boots. And then next to that was a jacket that was not folded, but was balled up. And inside of the jacket was a wallet containing cash and Robert Springfield's ID cards. The authorities launched a search in that area to look for the rest of Robert's remains. But unfortunately, they were never recovered. Also, his bow and arrows were never found. The FBI was brought into the case because foul play was suspected, and they eventually determined that Robert must have been shot. And then they later recanted that statement and said, actually, he was hit by a falling tree. But if he was struck... How does any of that make sense? None of that makes any kind of sense. Shout out... Shout out to the husband and wife moderators up in here. Thank y'all for hanging out with us tonight. How does this make any sense whatsoever? They said he was shot. Then they said he was struck by a tree. How you got skeleton bones, just the skull. Then you got the shoes right next to it. Then you got the belt nicely wind up right next. Then you got the jacket. No, 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 that don't make any sense. By a tree, then where is the rest of him? Wouldn't it have been in that area? And then why were all of his things neatly stacked? Certainly he wouldn't have done that after getting hit by a tree. So who neatly stacked his things after he was hit? 
And then also, where is his bow and arrows? But despite how improbable it sounds, that is the official theory, that he was wow. hit by a falling tree. The Crazy. family, along with many other people, believe he was attacked by someone or something up in those mountains. But if he had been attacked, his sons would have heard the struggle because they were in an area where sound carried really, really well. And if a person attacked him, why didn't they take the money out of his wallet? Also, where Robert's remains had been found was very close to where his original campsite had been with his two sons on the night he had gone missing. And so it was firmly located inside of the initial search grid. Wow. Meaning had he been under a tree or been left for dead by some attacker in that. I'm telling y'all, man, all three of these are alien. I'm telling y'all, all three of these are alien. They searched that whole area like crazy. And did this dude's remains show up? Like, no. Alien. Alien. That area, he would have been found in those first couple of weeks that they were looking before the search was terminated. So the fact that he wasn't found means either hundreds of people didn't see him, including a helicopter with thermal imager, or he wasn't there until after the search was terminated. And if so, where was he? And perhaps the weirdest aspect of this entire case is the claim by this hunter that a crow apparently lured him over to this tree stump where he found Robert's remains. If you believe this hunter's story, and many, many people do, then do you really think it's a coincidence that all of this took place on Crow Reservation, home of the Crow tribe? I think not. But will we ever know the truth about what actually happened to Robert? I didn't even think about that. It could have been the Native Americans. You know how they be up to weird stuff. I don't know. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found and I'm and I'm part Native American myself, as far as I know. I really need to do that twenty one of me DNA test thingy, so I can find out exactly what the heck I am, cause. I don't even know what I am. My mom told me not to came, claim black, so I, don't, I might not even be black. I don't know. I got to do that test to find out what my nationality is. But anyway, we got one more video. <laughs> Where's that video? All right, so check this one out. This one right here is called Top 3 Crazy Ways People Escape Death. Part 2, Mr. Ballin. Y'all boys and girls ready? We got 2,000 people. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to be shouting you guys out. There's copy merch on the website at the end of the live stream. I see the orders coming through. Let's go. Today, we're going to look at three of the most incredible survival stories of all time. This video is about 25 minutes long, so this is going to be the last one tonight. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button over to your house for Oreos and milk, but replace all of their Oreos cream filling with Play-Doh. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1994, 39-year-old Mauro Prosperi took part in the brutal Marathon des Sables, which is a six-day endurance race covering 155 miles through the Sahara Desert. The competition was known as one of the toughest in the world, but Prosperi was a former Olympic athlete, and he kept himself in unbelievable physical shape. He was also a police officer back in Italy, which kept him even more active, so he felt ready. The competition's desert terrain was so dangerous that participants had to indicate where they wanted their bodies sent if they did not survive the race. Oh, wow. In preparation for the race, Prosperi would run... I'm sorry, but I can't do a race where I gotta leave that kind of information. What? I got to let you know where I want my body to go if I don't make it out this race. Nah, that sounds like 
No, that no. I can't take those type of chances with my life. On 25 miles a day for weeks leading up to it, and he would give himself less and less water as he was running to get accustomed miles. to dehydration. Woo. But despite how much he was training and his incredible... That makes no sense. Get yourself accustomed to dehydration. Why don't you just keep hydrating? Look. Less and less water as he was running to get accustomed to dehydration. But despite how much he was training and his incredible athletic resume that showed he's someone that can probably do this, yeah. his wife was very concerned. But he would tell her, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen to me is I'll get a little sunburned. The race kicked off at its starting point in Morocco on April 10th. And initially, it was going very smoothly. Prosperi was always at the front of the pack, and he was always the first Italian to finish that day's stage. And so when he would finish, he would go to his tent, and he'd put an Italian flag on the outside to show the other Italians doing the race where they could find him to come inside and chat. And he would say that part of the race was really fun. Then things went wrong on the fourth day during the longest and most difficult phase of the race. When he set out that morning, it was already very windy, and he found himself in this section between these two big sand dunes, and the pace setters had already gone way ahead, so he's totally alone. And then out of nowhere, this massive sandstorm kicks Woo! up and completely blinds him. He can't go anywhere because he can't see where he's going. And so he manages to kind of feel his way to this rock where he gets down behind this rock. And he thinks to himself, I'll just wait it out and then continue on. But the sandstorm raged for eight hours. And when it was wow. finally done, it was totally dark outside, so Prosperi couldn't see anything. So he decides, you know what, I'm gonna have to sleep on the dunes and tomorrow morning I'll have to get up and keep going. And his biggest concern at this point was not that he was in a survival situation. It was, man, I was in fourth place in this race and now with this huge setback, I'm probably gonna finish last. And so when he went to sleep that night, all he was thinking about is, man, I gotta get up and go as fast as I can so I don't finish last tomorrow. But when the sun came up the next morning, Prosperi looked around and he realized he had a much bigger problem. The sandstorm had been so strong, it had completely altered the landscape. The dunes had all moved around, he had no points of reference, and so even though he had a map and he had a compass, he had no way to orient himself, so he had no oh, idea no. what direction to go. Anybody oh, no. that competed in this race really needed to be self-sufficient. And so Prosperi had a knife, he had plenty of dehydrated food, he had a sleeping bag, but he had very little water. He had about a half bottle of water mm. because at each of the checkpoints during the day, the race officials would give you all of this water. And the idea was you would drink it all by the time you got to your next checkpoint. And he had not made it to the next checkpoint and so was very low on water. Mm. As he's looking around, realizing this is a really bad situation, he thinks to himself, you know, other runners must have had this same thing happen to them. They probably had to hunker down yesterday during the sandstorm and they're they're just waking up now, they're looking around. I'm bound to find someone, we'll link up and we will get to the end of this race and we'll be just fine. It's and so he things. runs to the top of a sand dune and looks around expecting to see someone and he doesn't. There's no one in all directions. It's just completely barren desert. And so he leaves that sand dune, goes up another one and does the same thing. He's looking around and there's nobody there. And over the course of several hours, he was just running to the peaks of these different sand dunes, expecting to see someone not seeing anyone, becoming more panicked and expending more energy. And finally, by the late afternoon, when he's sweating profusely and the sun is bearing down on him and he still hasn't seen anyone, he realizes he's gonna die if he keeps doing this. Wow. And he needs to be smart about this. And so at this point, he went into survival mode. And he decided that the only times he's gonna move are gonna be at night and in the early morning hours, because those are the times when the sun is not up and it's still pretty cool and he can conserve energy that way. Yeah. He also began peeing into bottles and began conserving his urine to drink later when he did run out of water. And so over the Ew. next two days, he conserved his energy, but he was just kind of drifting through the desert and he wasn't really getting anywhere. It's he didn't crazy. know he was making progress because he had nothing to go to. He wasn't seeing anyone and he was starting to realize the situation is getting worse and worse by the minute. And then in an incredible stroke of luck, he comes across this Muslim shrine in the middle of nowhere that Bedouins would use as they traveled across the desert. Then he ran inside hoping that there'd be a person in there. And there was a person in there, but they were dead inside of a coffin. But he was happy that he now had shelter over his head and this felt like progress. He began taking stock of his new surroundings and when he was inside the shrine looking up into the ceiling, he saw it was lined with hundreds of bats. And at this point, he's really hungry, he's really thirsty, 
and so he climbed up into the rafters and began grabbing handfuls of bats and drinking their blood. Wow. After drinking the blood of 20 bats, he used some of the wood that was inside of the shrine, and he built a fire outside, and that would be his way to signal planes and helicopters going overhead that he assumed would be out looking for him. And so he sets the fire, and he comes back inside, expecting, you know, over the next couple of days, someone's bound to find him, but nobody does. And four days go by, what? and three separate times, a plane or a helicopter flew directly over him. He's got his fire going, he's out there flagging him down. Nothing. But Nobody saw him. Wow. So at the end of those four days, he's now been out in the desert roaming around for nearly a week, and he's starting to realize that this is the end. He's not going to survive this. No one knows where he is. No one's seen him so far. He's running out of supplies. This is it. And so knowing he was staring down a long, painful death, either by dehydration or starvation, he decided he was going to expedite it. And he would say later that he did not feel sad about this. It just was a logical choice he was making. He figured this way, if he died inside of the shrine, the shrine was more likely to be found than if he had died somewhere out in the desert where sand would cover him up. And so he said it was more likely people would find the shrine and therefore find him. And so there'd be closure for his family. And so Prosperi took a piece of charcoal from the fire, wrote a message to his wife, and then cut his wrists and laid down expecting never to wake up again. Wow. But the next morning he woke up and he had barely bled because his blood was too thick. He literally could not bleed to death. He took this as a sign that he was supposed to live and he suddenly felt motivated to survive. He decided to leave the shrine and follow the advice that one of the race organizers had given all of them at the start, which was if you get lost, follow the clouds you can see just beyond the horizon at dawn, there you will find civilization. So Prosperi hopped up and began heading towards what he believed were those clouds. He walked for days in the desert, grabbing snakes and lizards off the ground and eating them raw. He said his inner caveman came out, like his wow. primal desire to live, and he had no problems eating the things he was eating. Wow. Prosperi grew so dehydrated, he couldn't even urinate anymore. So he began drinking the liquid inside of succulents that grew inside of dried up riverbeds, and he also began sucking out the moisture in his wet wipes that were in his backpack. On the Ew. ninth day, Prosperi saw a little shepherd girl off in the distance, and she saw him, and she was scared of him, and she turned and ran away. And at first, Prosperi is devastated because he has no strength to chase after her, but she had actually gone down to her tribe and told them about this strange man wandering the desert, and they came running up over the dunes, and they brought him in, and they gave him food and drink, and they sent someone to get police. After police picked him up and brought him back to their headquarters, he discovered he had walked over 181 miles from where he had gotten lost on the course all the way to Algeria. His family and race organizers had gone out looking for him after he went missing, but all they ever found was his shoelace, and so they assumed he was dead. It would take him two years to fully recover from this ordeal, Woo. but after he did, he went on to run eight more desert races. Oof. How, wait, how does man... Uh-uh, I would have been true. There's no way. You think for a second I would have went out there and did another race? I'm black. We we learn from our mistakes. After something like that so bad, you almost die. There ain't no way I'm about to go out there and do another race. He went out there and did eight more after having to go through two years of recovery for what that experience did to his his body, his soul, his mind. He still went out there and kept racing. Oh no! Oh no! Woo! This is, that's a strong man right there. That's a strong. Not me. I'm weak. In 2012, 35 year old Jose Alvarenga was an extremely experienced fisherman, having spent years and years commercially fishing. In November of that year, Jose volunteered to do a 30 hour deep sea fishing shift for his company off the coast of his hometown in Mexico. He hoped he'd be able to catch some sharks, marlins, and sailfish three of the more lucrative fish you can catch. Unfortunately, the guy Jose usually went deep sea fishing with was not able to go at the last minute, but Jose still really wanted to go out and do the shift, and so he took the only other fisherman in their company that was willing to go or that could go, and it was a 23-year-old, extremely inexperienced, brand new fisherman named Ezekiel Cordova. And while Jose knew he was not gonna be a huge asset out on the seas, he figured, you know, it's a short trip and we're not that far off from shore, so you know what, he's fine, I'll take him. On November 17th, the pair set out on their 24-foot fiberglass skiff with a small motor. On board were various fishing tools, a radio, and a large ice box to hold all the fish they were going to catch. Once they reached the area they were going to be fishing, their trip immediately started paying off, 
and within just a couple of hours they had already almost completely overloaded the icebox. Their luck was so good that when they saw a storm coming in, they decided to wait and continue to catch as many fish as they possibly could before heading in at the very last minute. But the storm that was rolling in was like the storm of the century, and by the time they did turn around to head into shore, it was too late. They got caught up in this wicked storm where the rain was so intense they literally could not see to shore. They tried to use their compass and other instruments to navigate to shore, but between the winds and the waves and the fact that their boat was so heavy from the nearly thousand pounds of fish they had caught, they were just really unable to get anywhere near shore. When the storm just continued to rage and they were just kind of floundering in the water, they decided they needed to dump their catch. So they dumped all 1,000 plus pounds of fish back into the water. But even then, with a more agile boat, the storm was so severe they just could not navigate effectively. And so Jose turned off the engine and told Ezekiel that their best chance here was to just wait it out. And once it was done, they would head back into shore. But that storm continued to rage for five days. The torrential rain never stopped. The waves were huge. The winds were awful. And before long, they were getting pulled out to sea and had no idea where they were. Bruh, there ain't no way. I ain't never even been on a boat and I got seasick just thinking about this. I couldn't imagine y'all being out in the middle of the ocean. There's a storm going on for five days. You're on this boat and it's just being tossed. Woof, woof, woof. It was like having a little toy boat in a bathtub and you just making waves. Like, woo! Five days of that mess? Uh uh. I'm, look, I, I give up. I'm jumping in the water. <laughs> I'm jumping in the water. Woo -wee. Look, I'm going to go to the bottom of the deck and go to sleep. Y'all wake me up when this mess is done. I'm going to be down there like bleh, throwing up in my sleep. No, bro. There ain't no way. Shout out to Joshua. Thank you for the $5 Cash App donation. Appreciate you, brother. Um, thank you to all the people that's on the website copying merch. I know that I said there's some stuff that restocked surprisingly today on the website, stuff that was in inventory um, that was kind of hidden. But uh, I'm going to be getting to you guys shortly and shouting you guys out at the end of this video. You got about 15 minutes left. They had only planned to be out for 30 hours, so they did not have much in the way of supplies. And so after a few days, they had run out of food and they had run out of water. But luckily, because it was raining so much, they were able to drink the rainwater. But the real immediate problem they were facing is over the course of those five days, the storm was just battering their boat. Exactly. And by the time the storm cleared, their boat was ruined. Their motor had been torn off and was just gone. Their electronics were busted and all of their fishing gear was either damaged or gone. There was enough charge in the radio for Jose to call back to his boss on the mainland and send a mayday message, but the radio died before they got a return message, so they weren't able to confirm if anybody on land was going to come looking for them. Oh. Left with minimal supplies, no radio, no motor, Jose and Ezekiel just had to hope somebody on the mainland heard their message, and they slowly began to adjust to life at sea. Jose was able to leap into the water and catch turtles, fish, seabirds, and jellyfish with his bare hands. And so that's what they ate. Turtles and jellyfish? Oh, heck no. And then the two of them would try to catch rainwater whenever they could, but the majority of the time they had to drink their own urine and turtle blood. Despite their initial optimism that their boss had probably heard their Mayday message and would be sending people out to get them, as days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, they realized that probably no one was coming to find them. Oh, man, I would, woo! Oh, I would hate to be stranded out there and see with those thoughts come, going through my head of not ever being fined and potentially dying out there like that with no food, no water. That is insane, that is scary. What up, Miss Caramel? No, you, yeah, you very late. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kermit, yeah, um, stickers. I was talking about it with a friend of mine yesterday. I'm about to place an order for um, a few different types of stickers soon. I haven't had stickers in over a year. They're, they're coming back, though. Thanks for asking. Now their only hope was a plane spotted them flying overhead, or perhaps they could drift into a shipping lane and a boat could spot them. But without any way of navigating their boat, they really were just leaving it up to luck. Exactly. Despite their dire situation, Jose stayed really positive and he focused on catching food and catching water and he tracked the time really diligently by tracking. I mean, well, shit, there's that. <laughs> they got plenty of water to drink. 
I don't know if they care for the ocean water. What's that? Sea salt water? I don't know. And then hell, I mean, they got fish to eat. The phases of the moon. Ezekiel, however, just did not have a significant role on the boat because he just wasn't skilled enough. And so he found himself sitting in the boat most of the time doing a whole lot of nothing. And he fell into a deep depression. He was mm. not accustomed to being out on the water the way Jose was. Jose had been raised on the water. He practically only ate seafood and a lot of it he ate raw. So in a way, Jose was kind of at home, yeah. Ezekiel was not. And ah. then by the fourth month, Ezekiel just could no longer stomach the food they were eating. He would just get... These fools were out there for four months? Nah, 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 nah. I wouldn't have survived a month. I don't even eat seafood. Look, I would have... I wouldn't have survived a week because I don't even eat seafood. I would have been making myself... Ugh. It's disgusting, but I guess I gotta eat it to survive. Oh, it's been a whole week. I'm clocking out. See you. Nah, heck nah. Four months. Oh, with no ass even. Oh no. It's sick every single time, and so he just kind of gave up and he stopped eating. And even though Jose urged him to eat, would get him food, he didn't eat it, and eventually he starved to death. Even though Ezekiel was not a huge asset in terms of helping them survive, he did provide Jose an enormous amount of comfort. It's yes. like he had your partner in crime here. Yeah. And then once he died, Jose was alone for the first time in nearly half a year, and he fell into a very dark depression. And for six days, he did not touch Ezekiel's body. He just sat there and stared at him and even contemplated taking his own life. But on the seventh day, he doesn't know what it was, but he had this sudden urge to want to survive. And so he gave Ezekiel a kind of makeshift funeral. He said a few words and then disposed of his body in the ocean. And then after that, Jose became- That's insane, man. Could you imagine being on a boat with someone and watching them starve themselves to death? This story is crazy. Oh my God. I love hearing stuff like this because Sometimes we go through life not knowing the hardships that people have been through. Not knowing the stories and the struggles that people have endured in their lives. Laser focused on just surviving. And survive he would for another nine months. All by himself, out in the middle of the ocean, just floating around, drinking turtle's blood and drinking his own pee. But after the- Thank you, Renee Smith. I see you, sweetheart. Those nine months, he would finally see the thing he had been dreaming about land he had managed to drift all the way to the did this fool say nine months marshall islands so he leapt out of his boat he swam to shore and there was a hut right on the beach he knocked on the hut and a couple came to the door and they were totally shocked to see this guy i mean he, he didn't look too good and they couldn't even believe his story they, they couldn't believe that he had survived for so long in the water but they quickly brought him inside they gave him some food and drink and they contacted authorities and he was saved his parents and young daughter, when they found out he was alive, they were overjoyed. They, along with everybody else, believed he had perished. They had sent out a search party for them, and they'd found pieces of their boat that had broken off in the storm, and so they assumed, you know, they must have sank. Then, in a strange turn of events, shortly after he got home, people began accusing him of lying about what happened. Oh, makes sense. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. For one... I forgot my for one, but for two, you know how pissed off I would be if if people thought I lied about that story? Oh, I remember the for one now. For one, think about how mass the ocean is, how big it is for this man to have been, oh my God, floating for nine months before he got to land. What the, f oh my. That's how big the ocean is. And he had, there was a search team. They went looking for him, couldn't find him. That's how big it is. And there was above water the entire time, couldn't find them. I would have been so pissed if people thought I lied about that story. I'm like, man, F all of y'all. People said he looked too good to have been out on the open ocean for 14 months. He should have been emaciated, and at the very least, he should have had scurvy. But doctors say he ate so many turtles and seabirds that he was pretty well fed. 
and turtles and seabirds contain a high level of vitamin C that would have protected him from scurvy. Other skeptics said it would have been impossible for his skiff to float the 6,000 miles to the Marshall Islands where he ultimately found land. But then a study done at the University of Hawaii confirmed there was a current that would have pulled him from the coast of Mexico straight into the Marshall Islands. And then lastly, Ezekiel Cordoba's family accused Jose of killing Ezekiel and eating his body for sustenance. That's the only way he was able to survive. But Ezekiel roundly rejected that and took multiple lie detector tests that proved he did not do that. Wow. Today, Jose lives in a small town in El Salvador, completely surrounded by land, and he says he doesn't go anywhere near the water. You see, that's what I'm talking about. Remember, like, the dude that was out there running around in the desert and junk and, and was out there for how long? And he still went back out there and did that junk eight more times? I'm, I'm Ezekiel. I ain't, look, I don't ever want to see water again. You can never get me on another boat. I ain't trying to go on no swimming pool. I don't, look, never, ever. I was 14 months out there. You can, no, I don't, I don't even want fish no more. I ate all the fish and turtles and seafood that I can possibly ever want. I don't want it no more. I'm good. Thank you. And did y'all thought I ate a human? No, I don't, look, I don't. I don't even like people like that. In 1971, Julian Kepka was a bright-eyed German teenager who had just graduated high school. On Christmas Eve of 1971, she and her mother were at the airport in Lima, Peru, waiting for a flight to Pacolpa to visit her father, who was a zoologist working in the Amazon. She and her mother and everybody else waiting for this flight were really annoyed because the flight was seven hours late due to bad weather. Finally, it arrived and Julianne, her mother, and everybody else who had been waiting boarded Lanza Flight 508. And immediately after takeoff, they started hitting some pretty bad turbulence because of the bad weather. But Julianne really liked flying, so she didn't mind. Her mother, on the other hand, was white knuckling the armrests. But oh, after yeah. 10 minutes or so, as they were getting nearer to cruising altitude, the turbulence was not getting any better. In fact, Oops. it was getting much worse. And Julianne was starting to get worried herself. I ain't gonna lie, flying scares the mess out of me, man. I'm trying to keep positive about that junk. I'm about to take a flight in a couple of weeks. Whew, it's a short flight, like an hour 45. But still, like, I'm going to be thousands of feet in the air. That junk mad weird. And this big old metal freaking bird with a bunch of people. How does that? It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah, we almost through this video. We got about eight more minutes. I'm going to be shouting you guys out. This copy merch on the website. We got about... 2,400 people in here. Welcome, everybody. And then when the plane started shaking so violently that all of the overhead bins opened up and luggage and wrapped presents and Christmas cake started pouring out, Julianne now began white-knuckling the armrest. You. As she's sitting there, she looks out the window and she sees all this lightning right outside their window. And it was clear they were literally flying through a lightning storm. And so Julianne and her mother are just looking at each other, unable to speak because they're so scared. And they're listening to the other passengers screaming and yelling and everyone's starting to panic. And then the plane starts really shaking up and down like it's being lifted 50 feet and dropping 50 feet over and over. And then all of a sudden, there's this bright flash inside of the cabin and then the lights go out. And then they look out the left side and they see smoke and flames coming out of the engine that sits on the wing. And then the plane fell like it was just falling from the sky before it dipped into an aggressive nosedive and just started bombing straight down toward the ground. It turned out that big flash in the cabin was lightning striking the engine. Julianne would say despite this unbelievable chaos, the worst moment imaginable, her mother grabbed her by the hand and said, this is it, it's all over. And that was the last thing her mother ever said to her. After that, all Julianne can remember is the sound of other passengers screaming and crying and the awful grinding sounds that the engines were making. And as she's listening to these horrible sounds. Wow. Oh, man. Getting emotional a little bit. I'm over here putting myself in that position. Could you could you imagine that little girl or a little boy? You're on the plane. This crazy stuff happens. And then your mother grabs your wrist, looks you in the eye and tell you, this is it. It's all over. Woo! Getting ready to die. All of a sudden, the noise just stops. And she's outside of the plane. She's still strapped into her seat, but now she's in free fall away from the plane. And she remembers thinking how unbelievably lonely she was. And then she looked down and she saw the canopy of the jungle fast approaching and she knew she was about to die. And then she passed out. She remembers nothing of the actual impact, but she would later find out the plane broke up two miles up. 
So she was in free fall for two miles in that seat before hitting the ground. She woke up the next day looking upwards towards the jungle canopy and the first thing she said out loud was, I survived. And she's looking around and she yells for her mother but there's no one around her, no one yells back. And that's when she realizes I'm all alone and probably everybody, including my mother, is dead. She had somehow managed to not only survive, but only have a broken collarbone and some deep cuts in her leg. She could hear planes overhead that were most likely looking for the crash site and potentially survivors. Yo, this girl had to be in pain. I broke my clavicle, which is close to the collarbone, and that just hurt but she couldn't see them because the canopy was so thick, so they couldn't see her. She was wearing a very short sleeveless mini dress and flip-flops, but in fact, she had lost one of her flip-flops, but elected to keep the other one on because she had lost her glasses in the crash and she was incredibly nearsighted. Oh. And so she would use this one flip-flop to test the ground ahead of her before committing with her bare foot. Oh, before wow. the crash, she had spent a year and a half at her parents' research station out in the Amazon. And in that time, she'd picked up very valuable survival skills for being in the rainforest. Oh, wow. So the first thing she did was stand up and go looking for a stream because her father had told her, wherever there's a stream, that stream will oftentimes lead to civilization. And so she began walking and sure enough, she found a stream. Wow. And instead of just walking next to the stream, she got in it and began walking directly in the middle of the stream because her parents had told her that you're less likely to get attacked by a predator if you're standing in the water versus standing on land. She only walked... But you're more likely to get attacked by a gator, though. A little ways before she came across the crash site. There was no bodies, it was just debris, and all she could find that was useful was a small bag of candy. So she took the bag of candy and continued walking down the stream. And for several days, she trudged along, and she would say during the day it was incredibly hot and miserable, and at night it was very cold, and since she only had this small dress on, it was particularly miserable. Oof. But she said the scariest part of the whole ordeal was at night when you're trying to sleep it's totally pitch black and you're in the middle of the amazon and there's predators all around you she said it was horrifying on the fourth oh my god i could imagine that i that would be horrifying you're in the freaking middle of the amazon at night pitch black you can't see anything there's no lights and they ate all kinds of animals you you don't even know what's out there oh heck nah day of being in the jungle as she walked down the stream she heard the sound of a landing king vulture a sound that she recognized from her time spent at her parents amazon reserve and the sound of this vulture was just around the corner so she couldn't see it but she knew these huge vultures only showed up if there's a ton of dead meat and so she knew as soon as she rounded that corner she was going to come face to face with the bodies from the crash potentially even her mother wow. but she kept moving forward she turned the corner and sure enough, there were bodies. The vulture took off, and what she was left looking at was a bench with three passengers on it still buckled in, and all three of their heads had been rammed underneath the earth. They had clearly landed head first. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my. Oh my. If I ain't never not like airplanes before, I don't like them no more now. Woo! What? This girl came across the bodies, three bodies still strapped to the chair, to the seats on the plane, three of them, all together. Crashed down on earth, head first their heads in the ground. Oh, hell. The pain. The pain. Instant broken neck. Shattered skull. Just... Oh Immediately, she had an intense sense of panic because she had never seen a dead body before, and she thought one of them was her mother. But when she went over to examine this particular corpse, she saw her toenails were painted pink, and her mother never painted her toenails. And so she had this intense sense of relief that it wasn't her mother, but at the same time felt- I, I'm over here thinking to be this little girl out here like this. Ah, man. For any people that have ever dealt or been through something like this and survived it, wow, shout out to you.
I get on my knees and, and, and bow to you. That's crazy. Very ashamed of that thought. There was nothing on the three bodies or near them that could help her survive. And so she said her goodbyes and she continued walking down the stream. By the 10th day of this ordeal, she could barely stand straight because of a broken collarbone and the pain in her leg. And so she began drifting down the river in one of the deeper sections. And then she thought she was hallucinating when she saw this big boat docked up against the side of the river. But when she went up to it and touched it, it was real. She went up on shore, she looked inside, there was no one in the boat, but it looked like a boat that was used and there was a path that led back into the jungle. And so she followed the path and it led to this hut and no one was in there, but outside was a jug of gasoline. And she had this wound in her arm that was full of maggots. And she remembered her father using gasoline to get maggots out of a wound in their dog. And so she took the gasoline and dumped it in her arm and she said it was excruciatingly painful but she was able to pull out 30 maggots and felt Woo! very proud of that accomplishment. After that, she fell asleep inside of the hut and just hoped that whoever lived here eventually showed up. And it's so fascinating that this girl was able to pick up on things, you know, with uh, the experience of her family, you know, her father teaching her stuff and her really being able to survive this ordeal. This girl had 30 maggots in her arm and she poured gasoline on it and it lifted them up or made them want to come up to, to the point where she can pull them out. Her father was a goat. Sure enough, the next day she woke up and she heard two men talking outside that were walking towards her. And she said the sound of their voice was like the sound of an angel. And when the two men came up the path and saw her, they were obviously very shocked. And they initially thought she was like this water goddess from a local legend that involved a half mermaid, half woman that was light skinned. And she would tell them in Spanish that she's not a water goddess, that in fact she's a girl and she had just survived a plane crash and she really needed their help. It was getting late that day, so they couldn't bring her out of the jungle right away. So they helped treat her wounds, they gave her some food and water, and the next day they brought her back to civilization. The day after her rescue, she was reunited with her father, and apparently he was so overcome with emotion because he believed she was dead, that for several hours he just couldn't speak. Julianne was the sole survivor of the 91 people who boarded Lanza Flight 508. Her mother actually survived the crash, but then died several days later because she couldn't move. This is something that haunts Julianne and her family because they think about how horrible those last few moments for her mother must have been. Julianne. Oh, this is real picture of her. This is her. Insane. But that's crazy. The mother actually survived the crash, but she couldn't move. Pretty much probably starved to death out there. This is crazy, man. Ultimately recovered from all of her physical injuries, but to this day deals with significant emotional trauma. Ooh. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found- I bet she does deal with some significant emotional trauma. Goodness gracious, man. This is, woo. This is sad. Yeah, we done made it to the end of this live stream. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Shout out to Mr. Ballin. Always dropping the fire. Always dropping the heat when it comes to his storytelling. Absolutely amazing. D's Gaming, shout out to you. Welcome to the channel, y'all. We got almost 2,500 people in here. I'm about to drop these uh, shout outs real quick and then we'll be out of here. Shout out to Ashley. Miss Ashley M. Always hanging out with us during the live streams. Uh, Caleb, shout out to Caleb for joining us on Patreon this evening. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And uh, let's get over here on the website. I promise you guys I was going to shout out people that was stopping by the website and copying some merchandise and whatnot. So we're going to do just that and then we'll be out of here shortly. Tammy, shout out to Tammy. Tammy ST, shout out to you. Thank you so much. You done cop uh, like a Ghost of Real t shirt. Brandy, oh, Brandy done copped a few things. Two pullovers and a t-shirt. Shout out to you. Thank you so much. What, what, what you getting now? This is your 10th order with me. Got copping the Karen cap. I see you. I appreciate you so much, Miss Jimendez. Jimendez. Zoli, what you doing now? Oh, whoa, you caught. Hey, I see you copped that one Speak Your Truth blue shirt that I had available. That I found today. We put out we put that up on the website. Shout out to Tammy. Hey. Our well, hold on. Who's this? Miss Wood. Hello. This your ninth order with me. You got okay, I see you got one of them no mommy's wear shirts. That's what's up. Heck yeah. 
Harley, shout out to Harley D. Shout out to Emma R. Appreciate you guys. Shout out to Tina L. Who's how you say this name? Tun Soup. Oh, cop. Two of the two of the two of the that's cap cap. Hey, that's what's up. Hey, I got them in blue. They're coming back in black soon. You guys stay tuned for that. But hold on, we got something else that didn't came through over here. Christopher, shout out to Christopher. Thanks for another great live. Shout out to you, brother. Thank you for joining the channel as well. Appreciate y'all so much, y'all. We about to get out of here. Um, but yeah, tomorrow, same time, same place, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're doing another live stream. We are doing another live stream, so make sure y'all stay tuned for that. But y'all know what time it is. If you like this reaction, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Stay tuned for one more. Everybody asking for one more. They want one more. I just saw it. I just saw it on the screen. Everybody is saying one more. Everybody is saying one more. You know what? Since I love y'all so much. Since y'all love me so much. I'll give y'all one more. How about that? I'll give y'all one more. But I need to go blow my nose and get some water first. Can y'all wait just a little bit for me to do that? Let me hear it in the chat. Let me see y'all say, I'll wait. Yes, we'll wait. Let me see it. Let me see it in the chat. Yes, sir, we'll wait. <laughs> I need to blow my nose and I need to drink some water. My mouth is dry. <laughs> but uh, y'all is in here. Okay, y'all gonna wait? All right, let me go do this right quick. I'll be right back, okay? Okay, y'all good papers? I will be right back. Don't, don't go nowhere. Y'all miss me? Did y'all miss your boy? I'm surprised. We still have 1,900 people in here. For those that's asking about the Speaker 2 shirts, I'm going to probably bring them back after I hit a million subscribers. So y'all make sure y'all stay tuned for that. But yeah, somebody suggested in the chat, somebody suggested in the chat a story that Mr. Ballin here told that was one of his, his own personal experiences, paranormal one at that. So we're about to check that out. Andrea, shout out to you. Welcome to the team, baby girl. Liz, welcome to the team. We got some new members in here, baby. So we're about to check it out. Got my water. My nose is running a little bit. Can you do blue ho blue hoodies and beanies? Maybe face. I'm done with the face mask. I I had way too many of them. But I yeah I'm gonna do some blue um, hoodies eventually. That's for sure. I gotta get rid of some of what I have now though, um, Mr. Kermit. I got way too much 
way too many hoodies. I can't, I ain't got nowhere to put them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're about to get into this next video. This one got some length to it too. Oh my God, we're going to be in here a while, y'all. We're going to be in here a while, but you guys asked for it. It's still 1900 of y'all, so I'm going to give it to you. This next video is titled, What I Saw in My Room Still Hunts Me. It's close to 40 minutes long, you guys. We're about to check it out. Y'all boys goes ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Where is it? I clearly, I heard the door open. I heard the bells. I heard the pot. I heard the footsteps. I saw the door open. I see the thing walk in. I watched it walk down the aisle. I watched it bend over. It's in the room. Where is it? And this is night one. There's two more nights of this and it gets worse. No, when I was 16 years old, I was an avid snowboarder. Starting from the time I was like 12 years old, I used to always go snowboarding with the same two guys, my two very close friends, Wolf and Nick. Every winter, me, Nick, and Wolf would go up to Nick's family's cabin that was up in the, the White Mountains in New Hampshire. We just snowboard and it was great. Every time we went up to this cabin in New Hampshire, it would be me, Wolf, Nick and then Nick's mom and dad. Unexpectedly leading into my 16 year old winter, Nick's father passed away. We were actually planning on going on a trip to the mountains that, that winter. And I remember speaking to Wolf and being like, I don't even, I don't know if it's even appropriate to ask uh, about this trip because we knew that Nick was very close to his father and not to mention like every time we went on this particular you know trip up to the mountains the Nick's dad was always with us and it just seemed like how can we possibly now go on this snowboarding trip not only is it a low priority item but just the dynamic is, is all different now Nick called us and was like hey so uh, we are still going to do the snowboarding trip to the the cabin in New Hampshire and so you know Wolf and I we spoke and we're like Let's just go with it. I mean, maybe it's like, maybe they want to do something that is, that maybe is a fond memory of their, their father, their husband. And so we agreed to go. So he passes away maybe a few months, maybe a few months before we end up going up to the mountains. And so the, the grief was still definitely there, but also just again, that the dynamic was very, it was like the elephant in the room, right? Like as we're driving up, we drove in the same car. Uh, me, Wolf, Nick, and then Nick's mom was driving. It was so apparent that Nick's dad was missing. Mm. He was always in the car with us when we drove up. Anyhow, uh, so we make the trip up to New Hampshire and we're planning to be up there for three days. So the, the house itself wasn't really a cabin. It was a house. It was a small house. It was on a mountain. And if you think about the way a mountain works, it's a slope. And so in order to have a house level on a mountain, a portion of it needs to be on stilts right? The portion that's kind of hanging off the mountain. And then the other part of the house is kind of like embedded in the mountain itself. And when you drive up to the house, there's a wraparound porch that goes around the house. The majority of it is on the stilted section of, of the house, right? So if you're on the wraparound porch, uh, your footsteps are going to echo. Like you can hear those footsteps because you're, you're, you're above the ground. When you step into the house, you open a door. Uh, it actually opens inwardly. There were sleigh bells that were on the door, on the inside of the door. So anytime you open the door, you hear those sleigh bells ringing. And as soon as you step foot into the house, if you took one step into the house, right? So you, you step on the wraparound porch, you open the door, sleigh bells ring. When you step into the house, your right foot would be in the kitchen. You'd be standing on, on linoleum. And your left foot would be on shag carpet, which is like the dining room. And uh, that's the way the house is laid out. As soon as you walk in, kitchen on your right, uh, dining room on your left. And if you keep walking, you're going to enter into this living room. And if you turned around in the living room and looked up, you would see a, um, a lofted second floor. Um, if you walk into the house, again, your right foot's in the kitchen, your left foot's in the dining room. And you that would be mad annoying, man. You walk into a house and right in the freaking doorway of the house, you got two different textures to walk on. Linodium and carpet. I would be pissed. I'd be like, man, my left foot is all soft and my right foot is walking on hard floor. Walked as if you were going into that living space, but stopped about halfway across the house. 
you could look to your right and there'd be one hallway. There's only one hallway, it's a small house. And this hallway is bringing you, call it, into the mountain. If you think about, again, the layout of the house, you have a portion of the house that's sitting in the mountain and a portion of the house that's on stilts. Well, this hallway leads into the section of the house that's in the mountain. And if you go down this hallway and it turns left, it's a short little hallway, it brings you to one room. And that room is where me, Nick, and Wolf would stay every time we went snowboarding at this mountain. That room, if you go into it, it's a corner-fed room. Uh, you open the door, and immediately to your right is a bunk bed. I would, I would always sleep on the bottom bunk, and Wolf would sleep on the top bunk. Our feet would be closest to the door. In the center of the room, with the remaining space, because this is not a big room, there was like a, a queen-size bed. It was like a, a slightly larger bed that sat basically in all of the free space that was left over in the room. It was sitting right in the middle of the room and that's where Nick would sleep. So basically the room was completely packed with three places to sleep and really not much else. There was a very small space between the queen size bed and the uh, bunk bed. So you could walk between those two, but that was about it. So that layout's very important and you'll see why. We snowboard for the day, we come back to the cabin and me, Nick and Wolf decide we're gonna crash super early and get up early and have a full day of riding ahead of us because we're avid snowboarders. So we, we hey you gotta have like some strength to do that because i've tried snowboarding once that jump was the most taxing most exhausting thing i'll never want to do it again i'm too fat go to our room the one that's kind of you go down that hallway and you get to the room i just described we plan on going to bed early but we were excited and so we stayed up gaming for a bit and then maybe around like 11 or 12 o'clock at night uh nick who again is in the queen size bed and wolf was in the top bunk they ultimately fall asleep I was still awake, and what struck me, and it always struck me, whenever I slept in this room, is when you turn off all the electronics and you're just laying in bed in this house, in particular, this, this room, it is pitch black. There's no windows, you're in the segment of the house that's, you know, in the mountain. It is truly pitch black. Not to mention the house itself, there weren't really any neighbors nearby, because this house uh, Nick's family had purchased it a while ago when this used to be an active ski resort, the mountain itself that it was on, but it wasn't anymore. And most people that were living there had left and sold their property. Uh, but a few people had decided to stay. And so Nick's family was one of them. So they had this cabin on an abandoned ski resort. Uh, there was virtually no street lights. There's virtually no neighbors. And so at night when you're laying in this room, like I was this night, you're really struck by just how dark and quiet yeah. it is. I mean, basically no white noise. I mean, silence and pitch black. And so I'm laying there, and one other detail that needs to be uh, brought up before we get into what actually happens. So Nick had two much older brothers. They were in their 30s, and you know, we're 16 years old. And um, we were expecting one of them, we didn't know which, to swing by the house at some point over the next few days. Uh, that's what Nick's mom had said. Nick had kind of reiterated it. And I think that Wolf and I understood that, you know, now that Nick's father was gone, that they were just kind of trying to find a way to fill the void that was left from the father passing. And so we were expecting over the course of that weekend for someone, uh, one of the two brothers, to come to this house and stay with us for a night or whatever it was. I had never met either of these two brothers. I knew they existed, but I had never met them before. But somewhere in the back of my mind, I know that probably one of them is gonna show up at some point, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, whenever it is. Uh, man, it's giving me goosebumps just thinking about this. So that night as I'm laying in bed, I'm thinking about how dark and quiet it is. I remember the, the only light in the room was the digital clock, uh, the little red digital clock, and it was like a beacon in the light. And that doesn't emit much light, but when it's pure darkness, it does. And I just could not fall asleep. I, I remember I got to a place where I started counting how many hours of sleep I might get if I fell asleep right then and there, which is never a good sign. That means you're not close to sleeping. Right. If, if you're like, okay, if I fell asleep now, I'll get three hours and 22 minutes of sleep, right? Like that's where I was at mentally. At some point, uh, I think it was around three in the morning, I remember looking hey, at the clock and thinking, wow, it's got... Hey, um, Wilfred, if you're still in here watching, email me, brother. Tell me what's going on. I'm so late. I'm still still awake. I hear footsteps on the wraparound porch. 
in a situation where, you know, as I'm telling it, you're going to think, how did you not raise, you know, a red flag immediately? In real time, in real life, your brain goes to great measures to convince you that everything is okay. Yes. It really takes an enormous amount of, of anomalies to stack up for your brain to say something's wrong. Yeah. And so that's what happened in this first night. I hear footsteps on the wraparound porch, and I immediately assume, even though we're talking, it's like 3 in the morning. I just assume that it's got to be one of Nick's brothers arriving to be a part of this, this weekend getaway. So I really actually didn't think anything of it. I, I actually just thought, well, you know, when he comes in the house, if he happens to come in here to check on us, I'll just pretend to be asleep in case, you know, he were to see that I was awake. I don't want to have a conversation with him. Number one, it's three in the morning. Number two, I, I don't know the guy. I'm, you know, I'm just going to pretend to be asleep. So that's all I'm thinking about. Not worried, not scared, not anything. Footsteps on the wraparound porch. And then the door opens, and I can hear the sleigh bells that are on the door itself. I can hear those chimes as the door opens. Again, no part of me is concerned about this. I'm thinking it's a little bit weird that they're arriving at 3 in the morning. But we knew that their brother, his brothers had these weird work schedules where it, they might show up in the middle of the night. So it was just, it, it was whatever it was. Yeah, I mean, it can happen. Sleigh bells ring. Um, and then Every time he says sleigh bells ring, I'm thinking like a Christmas song. I hear a, what sounds like a pot, like a kitchen pot, fall and hit the linoleum floor in the kitchen. And I remember just the sound st stood out to me. It just seemed like this person's kind of making a bit of a commotion in the middle of the night here. And the door didn't shut. And I noticed that. Um, I figured they were maybe bringing their stuff in, right? They're offloading some stuff. And they're leaving the door open. Oh, this is... Just thinking about this is really making me feel uncomfortable. So I hear the footsteps in the wraparound porch. The door opens. I can hear the sleigh bells. A pot falls and it hits the, the, the linoleum floor. The footsteps that I could hear on the wraparound porch, because it's on stilts, right? Like the porch is hovering over the ground. You can hear those footsteps. Well, when, they, when these, these footsteps continued into the house, where you're on a concrete slab, and there should be no sound. Like I shouldn't hear echoing footsteps. It sounded like it was on the wraparound porch still, but the noise was getting closer to me. So it was like the footsteps sounded totally natural out on the wraparound porch, but once they were in the house, it didn't really make any sense that I could hear them as if it was, as if the footsteps were standing on something that was suspended off the ground, but it wasn't. You're in the house on a concrete slab. And so I hear these footsteps, the door hasn't shut, the front door is wide open, we're in the middle of winter here, we're in the middle of nowhere too. And I'm thinking about that, but I'm still thinking it's got to be Nick's brother, one of Nick's brothers. The footsteps continue through the house, and they stop about halfway through the house, if you open that door and walk halfway through the house. And then the footsteps begin to walk down the hallway towards our room come down the hall and they get right outside the door which is shut the door to our room is shut and I'm sitting there again my feet are closest to the door it's pitch black in the room minus the you know digital clock and I'm thinking why didn't they shut the front door of all the weird things that have happened the fact that I'm hearing footsteps as if they're on the wraparound porch but they're getting louder and moving through the house the thing that really just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up was why didn't they shut the front door? That just seems like such a bad idea. There's animals out there. There's a host of things out there. Like, why aren't you shut? And not to mention, it's freezing outside. There's a space between the bunk bed, the bottom bunk that I'm on, and the top bunk. There's a space that I can see clear as day. Whoever walks in the room, I'm going I'm to see them when they walk past the foot of the bed. But because of the top bunk, my view is actually obscured, and I wouldn't be able to make out someone's face, for example. I could really only see their like middle section. And so when the door opens, and this shadow figure walks into the room, which by the way, you're, I'm in a pitch black room, and I clearly make out a black silhouette. This thing walks into the room, and it's, it's obscured, so I wouldn't have been able to see it, its head or upper body anyways, but its hips, are so high 
that I can't even really see those. Those are at the level that I would expect someone's upper body or head to be at. Meaning this figure that's walked in, its legs are extremely long. Uh, and so if it was proportionally the size of a human, you're talking about maybe a 10 foot tall person, but we're in a, a space that is not a 10 foot high ceiling. And so this thing walks in and as soon as I see it, and I make out that black silhouette, even though it's pitch black in the room, I clearly see the silhouette that is unnaturally tall, combined with all the things that I've just thought about, mainly the door's still open, uh, they've made kind of a commotion, I can hear these weird footsteps, I instantly was frozen with terror. Frozen, petrified. I, well one, I'm like, it's not Nick's brother. And even if we're not talking about paranormal here, this is such a bad situation, even if that's just some dude who's come into the house, that's a really bad situation. So no matter what, this is a really bad situation, but what I'm looking at doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's an unnaturally tall person, they've left the door open and I hear their footsteps all over the house and it walks in past the foot of the bed. And I'm laying there and I can't see higher than its waist because it's obscured by the top bunk. And this thing makes this like facing movement, like a military facing movement, and begins to walk down the aisle between the queen size bed in the middle of the room and the bunk bed where I am. Wow. And it's walking down right next to me and I'm, I'm literally sitting there unable to move. And I remember thinking, I can't do anything. I'm truly frozen with terror. And all I remember thinking is, whatever happens, just don't bend down and look at me. That will ruin my life. I know that's right. I know that's right. Oh my, that would have been the worst thing ever. That would have been the worst thing ever. If you go walk in and walk out, cool. But if you look at me, oh, I'm a faint. I'm a faint. I'm a die. I'm a die. This thing so much as looks at me. That's it. I'm done. So it walks down the aisle. It's right next to me. I can't. I'm, I'm literally frozen. And it does another quick movement, but it's facing away from me now. Facing towards Nick in the center of the room. And it bows onto and then down through Nick's bed and disappears. In the movies, in a movie, as soon as the ghost disappears into the floor, whoever's hiding would make a run for it. In real life, there's no such thing as ghosts. There's no such thing as people disappearing into the ground. So I'm expecting this thing to just get back up again. Exactly. I, mean, I couldn't understand that. If That's how I would have felt too, yo. He, this story sounds believable because he made the analogy between movie and real life. I would have thought the exact same thing had I been in this predicament. I would have been like, okay, what, whatever that thing was, it's going to come back. It's going to rise back up again shortly Christina welcome baby we got a new member in here this is insane it was disappeared. welcome we got 200 2112 people in here baby here into the bed that's not possible where is it I clearly I heard the door open I heard the bells I heard the pot I heard the footsteps I saw the door open I see the thing walk in I watched it walk down the aisle I watched it bend over it's in the room where is it and for hours, I mean, all night, I laid there absolutely petrified, expecting this thing to come back up and just look at me. Right. That was like my biggest fear. Is what me too. I'm telling you, I would have felt the same way if that thing would have looked up and just looked at me, got back up and like, hey, I, woo, not me, not me. I would have been terrified if that thing looked at me. Whatever this thing was, I did not want to, I did not want it to look at me. So that was the worst. I'm laying there, frozen. I can only move my eyes. All night. Sound like he was um, in a, par a paralysis state. Finally, I hear Nick's mom out in the living room making coffee. I mean, this, this was probably like 5, 6 in the morning. And it, it was like the first time that I'm like, okay, I, I, I'm safe now. Even if it's in the room, I'm, I'm safe to just go because I can hear someone out there. And it's, I, could, I could hear her speaking. I knew it was her. And so I go right out there. And now you got to understand that even though this was a horrible situation right. that I still can't really explain. Yeah. 
I know that she has just lost her husband. And so the idea of approaching the subject, which effectively is going to turn into uh, ghosts. Right? Yeah, this, this wouldn't be a very good conversation to bring up to her. Oh, no. I've never had a paranormal experience before this. I've never had a paranormal experience since. Right? Like, I'm, I'm more or less a skeptic, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to start talking about ghosts. Right. To the woman who's recently bereaved. It just felt really inappropriate. Exactly. And so I was really struggling with how I... Well, lucky for him, he was a, a brighter 16-year-old than I was. I wouldn't even thought about that. I would not even thought about that. I would have been like, um, something happened weird last night. And I'm terrified. I wanted to communicate what happened. I would so have. I went to the table. She got me a cup of coffee. And, she's kind of, and we know each other well. You know, she knows me well. And she definitely picked up that something was wrong. But didn't really ask anything yet. She was just kind of puzzling, like kind of sizing me up a little bit. And the only thing I could think to do was to just ask, you know, hey, did did either of your two sons, you know, Nick's older two brothers, did, did they did they stop by at any point last night? Did they stop by? And she's like, no. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there like, okay. And I'm just like, I must have had a reaction that was obvious to her. And she just goes, I heard my husband here last night too. And, you know, that made it a lot worse. Yes. I would have been like, um, can you take me back home? Because I'm not fooling with you or your boys no more. Um, you heard your husband here last No, uh-uh. I gotta go. Uh uh, nah. Tell your son it's been it's been real. You know what I'm saying? It was nice knowing him. We had some good runs on the snowboard on the slopes, you know. <laughs> but I can't hang out with him no more. You know what I'm saying? Peace. Nah, not me. Because on on the one hand, you have a situation where she is confirming something that part of me hopes is a bad dream. Right. Number two, she's now saying it's her husband. Wow. And so I intuitively assumed that she has somehow figured out what I'm stressed about that probably isn't real. And because she's in, because she's grieving, she's created a story where her husband is now in the house, you know, looking over us. I really believed that she didn't hear anything, that she just somehow understood that I had had this weird feeling and she turned it into a, oh, my husband's in the house. Interesting. I'm glad, that's dope that he kind of put that together that way in his head. Not me. I would have been like, nah, heck nah. You saw him too? Yeah. Oh, you heard him too? Yeah, nah, I gotta go. But nah, he's like, yo, I don't think that she actually saw him or heard him. She just sees the look on my face and know that I experienced something last night. So she's turning it into that. Uh, nah, I'm not sticking to that one. And I just couldn't ask any more questions at that point. I felt like I had, I had set her up for this awkward exchange. I felt really bad that like that was the discussion we were having. I also thought like if that she said that not you. That's true. I don't want to have this conversation. Like I really was just dumbfounded on what to do in this situation. And this is night one. There's two more nights of this. That was night one. Nah, you taking me home, lady, 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 lady. I gotta go home. I don't want to snowboard no more. I broke my leg. I broke my foot last night. My toe. You see my toe? This one right here. That big one is is messed up. That you see the toe? Wait, hold on. Y'all can't see it, but my toe broke. I can't snowboard no more. Take me home. I can't do two more nights. This been. It's already felt like three nights. It's only been one. It gets worse. So Nick and he said it gets worse. Oh Lord, here we go. Both eventually come out of the bedroom and they come to the dining room and. The same way I felt reserved talking to Nick's mom about what happened, I had the same feelings about Nick because it was his father. Exactly. And I also just felt like that would be inappropriate. But Wolf, 
he's not a family member and he's my buddy and I kind of pulled him aside and I kind of told him what was going on as best as I could but I kept it like kind of generic I was like you know I, I, I could have sworn I heard someone in the house last night like I, I could have sworn and he's like yeah you know you, you probably dream you know like that's 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 what this is and I was like no like I wasn't but I can't make, I can't make sense of it and I was like can you just do me a favor and at this point, Nick actually overheard the conversation, and I kind of, I very much kind of cut ties with what I was talking about. I was like, yeah, I just thought I heard something last night. It's just me freaking myself out. And I was like, can you guys tonight, when we get back from snowboarding, can I fall asleep ahead of you? That way, I'm asleep, you guys can just fall asleep after I do, and then I'll sleep through the night, no, no big deal. And they're like, all right, yeah, weirdo, whatever. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, my big plan is I'm just going to go to bed really, really early. Cause I didn't sleep the night before, so I'm thinking, oh, I'll fall, I'll fall asleep right away. So we go out, we snowboard for the day, my mind is off of what happened, and, and frankly, I'm starting to convince myself that that had to have been, you know, sleep paralysis, even though I'd never had that before, I, I, I was Googling some stuff, and sleep paralysis, maybe it was just like a really intense dream. Uh, you know, I would just like, it, it, there has to be something. Like this is, this is too weird, I'm, it, it has to be something explainable. Turns out it wasn't. We get back from snowboarding, and I am immediately going to bed. Pretty much immediately. It was like maybe 6 o'clock. I was like, I'm going to bed. And I get in bed, and all I'm thinking about is what happened the night before. And I if you go to bed at 6, you're going to wake up at 3 and, and spook yourself all over again. Nope. I can't fall asleep. Eventually, Nick and Wolf, they come in the room, and... They're trying their best to stay awake so that I can fall asleep, but it's getting later and later and I can't fall asleep. And now I'm back to that like, okay, if I fall asleep now, I get six hours of sleep. And they, they finally just said, hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. So they both fall asleep and I'm, I'm awake. Damn. And I was so upset with myself. Like, you screwed yourself. Damn. Why didn't you just fall asleep, you dummy? And I remember the only thing that I did that really made this real, looking back at it, is I put a knife, like a kitchen knife or something, in the springs above me. So I'm in the bottom bunk, like basically right under the top bunk, I put a knife in there. What? And I'm laying in bed and I'm constantly looking over at the digital clock. And it was probably around 3 a.m. It was late enough that it was like, okay, this is about the time that happened last night. And my heart just sunk why when I heard those footsteps on the wraparound porch again they sounded the same as they did the night before I was like that has to be one I would have been terrified my next brothers the door opens I hear the sleigh bells I hear the freaking pot fall on the ground it was like deja vu the exact wow. same thing is happening and these footsteps start walking through the house. And again, referencing how movies would portray this, you know, the, the person who's, who's me in the movie is like, okay, I'm gonna get this knife and I'm gonna position myself over here because I know what's gonna happen and I'm gonna protect myself. In real life, I'm like, this thing's gonna be in my room, potentially. Exactly. It happened last night. It's apparently happening again. Exactly. Please, for the love of God, don't bow into me the way it bowed into the floor the night before. You're going to bow into this knife, sucker. What up, Wendy? Thank you, baby. Don't look at me. It, it, will, it will ruin my life if some entity just engages with me, just looks at me. That will ruin my life. This thing walks down the hall, and I hear those footsteps coming down the hall. And just pretend for a second, forget the paranormal aspect. Right. Pretend it's the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And you, a, a stranger is walking around your house. That alone is horrifying. Yeah. The footsteps come right outside the door, and I'm looking at the knife that's right underneath the bed. Man, I'd be afraid that knife fall out and fall and flip and stab me. And I'm petrified. I cannot move. I'm drenched in sweat. Just from the few seconds that it's taken this thing to so did this thing was this sleep paralysis again if he can't move go from the door to the front of, of my bedroom because i know what's happening again it's happening again i'm not crazy it's just happening again what the f is this 
and I'm petrified, I, I can't reach. I'm so worried about making any noise that would alert this thing that I'm here, that it's, I can only move my eyes. And I remember even thinking that I shouldn't move my eyes too quickly because it, it might hear that. Like this is a primal level of fear. That's crazy. He's scared to move his eyes, bro. God dang. The door opens. It walks into the room. goes right past the foot of my bed. And I'm, again, petrified. And it walks down. After making its facing movement, it walks down the aisle between me and Nick. And I remember what happened the night before where it folded into Nick and disappeared. And I'm just thinking to myself, please don't turn and bow into me, please. Whatever Woo! happens, just don't do that. Yes. So it turns away from me and does the same thing it did the night before, folds onto Nick and disappears into the ground. But again, even though in the movies, this would be the same thing happening, you know, night two, it's the same routine. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, the ghost is in the floor now. I can, I can go alert the authorities. No. Because now it's safe. Uh-uh. In real life, I'm like, where to go? Exactly. I know this happened last night, but it still doesn't make any sense. It's Dude, I couldn't imagine. Like, if this really happened to him and he wasn't sleeping, bro, I would be tripping. In the room, it has to be. Is this a real thing? It, it came in the room. It, it's somewhere. Is it under my bed? Where is it? All night. Woo. All night. I lay there. This is the second night that I've not slept. That's when crazy. I heard Nick's mom out in the other room, it was like such a relief. Because I didn't give a crap at this point about being polite. I wasn't going to like try to, you know, distance myself from the conversation around ghosts. I was going to go out there and be like, what's wrong with this house? And so I hear her and I go right out to the, to the living room and I tell her everything. Uh oh. As acute detail as I possibly can. What up, fresh boy? And as Welcome. I'm telling her this, her reaction didn't line up. Her reaction was not surprise, terror, confusion. It was empathy. She felt bad for me. It was sympathy. What? You don't understand. Like I'm listening, but you just you just don't understand what's happening. And I'm telling her all the like, I mean every detail I can possibly muster. And at the end of it, or towards the end, she just kind of stops me. She's like, John, I told you yesterday, and, I, and, and again, I, I heard it last night. That's just my husband. I heard him last night, too. Oh, my God. How could she possibly think that, though? You got nothing to worry about. And I was like, no. 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 I, I, that, that, that cannot be, that cannot be what it is. I, I don't like, accept it. I heard him. Open the door. I heard a pot fall. Oh, I snap. Heard walk through the house. I'm assuming he went into to next room again with you guys. And I'm like, what is happening? This is crazy. So, totally now just beside myself. He just remember, bows down into Nick. I was crying, actually. Like, during this conversation, I'm just crying. Not even like tears of sadness as much as just like what's happening like i, I needed my mom <laughs> I, I felt so helpless and no offense to nick's mom but i just felt like i was with a lunatic dude and that was night two? Oh snap how but like at the same time she's recalling the exact same things as me how, how do i put that together Bro, bro, at this point, you need to go get Nick, bring him to his mom, and sit there and have that whole conversation so that Nick will know that you're not crazy or at least realize that both you and his mom is crazy. I remember thinking, I need to leave. Yeah, to that's what I said. Night one. Night one, you need to get the heck up out of there. Get out of here. I can't be here then I thought about, like, how am I going to make this happen? Right. Take their car. They'll be all right. Just drop it off at their house back home, you know. They got a, this is their, this is their, their freaking getaway house. They got a whole other house. Nick's mom and Wolf and Nick, they're not leaving today. 
right? No, they're not. That's why you need to go ahead and steal the car keys. They will. It's okay. It's no big deal because you're just really just borrowing the car. You know, you're going to take it back. You know, they got to hold another home. Just, you know, take it there. And it was pretty clear that Nick's mom liked the fact that she, you know, heard her husband walking around the cabin. She's not trying to. She think that's her husband. That could be a whole demon. I wouldn't. Nope, not me. I'm not. I'm not trusting that story. There's one more night that we're here, and... I can't do another night. I, I couldn't even do the first night, really. I would have to tell my parents to drive, my mom or my dad, to drive to New... Yeah, you should have the first time, boy. You just, Look, at this point, if you don't, ain't no telling. That thing might bow down into your ass at this time, boy. Look. Hampshire, come get me. Because I'm seeing ghosts. Like this is I don't care what lie you tell your parents. They need to come get your butt, fool. Look. It's a trip that I loved. I look forward to this trip. Every year. Not it no more. It not any sense. And they would have been like, what's wrong with you? And I honestly was not prepared to have those conversations with my mom and dad. I was not prepared to be like, let me tell you about the ghost I saw over the past two days. And so I was just kind of resigned and decided to stay. In retrospect, um, I think I should have called my parents. And you think? I'm not staying, fool. And been like, that's what parents are for. Like, get the hell up here. It doesn't matter why. Come get me. It does. But it was such a confusing moment that I had no blueprint for how to handle. So I just stayed. Nick and Wolf finally get up. And I remember I made the decision as I'm sitting there thinking about what's happening is... Nick's mom is reassuring me, you know, about her husband being in the house. And I make the decision that I'm going to stay. Nick and Wolf come out of the room. And they come over and Wolf pretty much immediately looks at me to get a gauge on what happened. And you can see it all over my face. I'm, I've been crying. And I told them what happened. And Yes, good. You know, Nick, Nick was always kind of a stoic. And he was just unaffected. You know, Wolf, on the other hand, was more inclined to, at a minimum, believe something was happening. Interesting. He didn't know if it was a ghost or not, but he certainly understood that something's going on. And the fact that Nick's mom, as I'm explaining to Nick and Wolf what's going on, she was, she was like, reinforcing my argument. Yeah, I heard him, too. I heard the door open. Yeah, I was upstairs. I heard him walk through the house. That's crazy. And Wolf's like going on and Nick is like he didn't want to hear it kind of it, it probably was uncomfortable it's about his father or ultimately talking about his father before we went out snowboarding for the day because Nick's mom who still went snowboarding not me I'm not would drive us and drop us off she brought us uh, to a, a local store and we bought a coffee table because they've been looking to replace the one that was in their house basically when you walk into the house Instead of turning down the hallway towards our room, if you just keep walking into the lofted area, at the foot of the stairs uh, was a coffee table where they kept a landline phone because you're in the middle of nowhere and you got to have some way to call. And they put it right at the foot of the stairs in this little coffee table. But it had broken or it was old or whatever. I know that they've wanted a new one for a long time. We went out and got it. Me, Nick, and Wolf, we go. We snowboard. Um, we come back. We help offload the coffee table into the house. We put it at the foot of the stairs. Um, and that night we go to bed. I was ruthless in trying to keep Wolf and Nick awake. I mean, I wasn't even trying to make jokes <laughs> out of it. I was like straight up kicking the bunk, uh, like kicking Nick, Wolf. Yo, bunk, he was like really trying to keep shake. them up. That's crazy. Nick, I was doing everything in my power to keep them awake. Cause this I, fool ain't been asleep in three days. I couldn't sleep. I'm terrified. I'm terrified. It was like the opposite of how excited you get before Christmas and you can't sleep. It was like the opposite of those feelings, but you still can't sleep. It was like, this is the worst night of my life. And also, the, 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 the nail in the coffin, if you will, is during the day that day, we found out that neither of Nick's two brothers were going to be making the trip. They weren't going to make it. So no one's going to be at the house. No one should be at the house except for us. And so that night I'm laying there, and after all my attempts to keep Nick and Wolf awake, they fall asleep, everyone's asleep, the house is pitch black, it's silent, and around 2, 3 in the morning, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it, I 
hear those footsteps on the wraparound porch. Uh -oh. The door opens and I hear the sleigh bells ringing on the door. A pot falls on the ground and the footsteps walk into the house. Oh, snap. And this is the third time. Right. This has happened. So in a way. So what happens? Does this fool, like, are, are, are the boys, the other guys still awake now? Okay, this was the first time that I was expecting something to happen. For it to walk down the hall, come in the room, to come next to me, fold into Nick, and then that's it. This was the first time I had a little bit of, call it security, that something was going to happen and I understood what was going to happen. I didn't understand it, but I expected something to happen. But this was not the case this night. It walked into the house. Everything was the same. It walked into the house, but instead of going down the hallway towards our room, it kept walking into the lofted area. And the lofted area from where I was laying, I, my foot's at the, the door, my head's back here, the wall straight, if I like sat up in bed and looked straight, the wall right there led into the area where this thing was. So I'm talking, I'm basically, if there wasn't a wall, I'd be looking dead at this thing. And I'm waiting for it to walk through the wall. As right. crazy as that sounds, I'm right. just anticipating something coming through the wall. After a long pa uh, pause of it being in that lofted area, I hear it go up the steps. Listening to the creak of the steps as it goes up the steps. Like, are the other guys awake at this point? It makes my skin crawl. It, it, it's making me like emotional thinking about how terrifying walks up the stairs, and now it's above me. Oh! And if the past two nights are any example, this thing has sunk into the ground two nights in a row and disappeared. And so now my fear is it's going to literally come through the ceiling exactly onto me. Woo! The sounds... You need to move, bro. Get off, get off your bed. Go lay on another bed or something. Get under the bed. I don't know what you need to just get out of that. No, get out the room. That's what you're supposed to do. That's the problem right there. You needed to get out the room at that point. Stopped when it was upstairs. Got upstairs, and that's where Nick's mom slept. She was upstairs. So I laid in bed, petrified once again. I got my stupid knife sitting on the underside of the bed above me. And hours and hours of waiting for my literal worst nightmare to come true as some entity comes through the ceiling and goes into me. Right. Or even just if it was like onto Nick, if it came through the ceiling and if out of my peripheries, I'm watching like this beast come through the ceiling and float down and into Nick. It's just all these thoughts in my head, they didn't make any sense. They were terrifying, but they were happening. I laid in bed and I couldn't fall asleep. I was now coming up on three days without sleep. So at some point, Man, this fool just been hallucinating the whole time. That's all it is. He's just sleepy. That night, I did fall asleep. Probably just out of sheer exhaustion. At some point in the morning, early morning, now probably like 5 in the morning, I, I wake up again and I can hear Nick's mom. It didn't sound like she was making coffee. It sounded like something was wrong. I couldn't place it, but it just sounded like there was she was acting emotional somehow. I couldn't tell if she was crying or not. But now it's like it's the morning. It's my last day, I'm leaving today, I'm up, I'm out. And as soon as I walk out, I walk out of the hallway and I look to the left into the dining room where I expect to see Nick's mom and she's not there. And she's actually over at the foot of the stairs in the, uh, the lofted kind of living room area next to this new coffee table we had just put in. And she's standing over this coffee table at the foot of the stairs where the, the entity had been the night before, the one deviation from the other two nights. And she's crying. Come here. She points to the coffee table. And she's down on her knees looking at the table. And now I can tell she's probably crying tears of joy. Because scratched into the coffee table were the words, I love you. I was like, I'm done. That ended my friendships. Duh! I told you I would have been the same way. I'd be like, bro, nah. I'm not friends with y'all no more. This is crazy. Uh, wolf to a, a lesser degree, but I never, I stopped snowboarding. I didn't go back to that cabin, even though I know Wolf did the next year. The theories about what happened, you know, Nick's mom 
It's possible she could have created a narrative, made it about her husband, and then she could have just as easily scratched that into the table. The I love you. That could have been her. Um, I mean, it's also possible that she had sleep paralysis and I had sleep paralysis, and somehow we synchronized and had the same vision, and she scratched on the table. That would be very fascinating. Think if that was the actual case. That's, I don't know, hard to believe. Or, to be, to be honest, what I believe that was a ghost, and that it interacted with the physical world, and it did walk around the house. It did carve I love you into that table. Um, Sheesh. and you know, I, it's the only time in my entire life that I've had anything happen like that. I don't have any other paranormal stories before or after that's it. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to continue to do long versions of my ghost stories and scary stories that I find that I usually that I've been posting on TikTok. I'm going to do long versions of those, uh, on this YouTube channel. That's going to be the new direction for this channel. Wow. Man, that was crazy. I don't blame you, Mr. Baller. I ain't going back that cabin no more either. But anyway, y'all, we made it to the end of the live stream. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. Thank you so freaking much. Hold on. Whew. I'm tired, y'all. I need to go take my butt to sleep now. But anyway, y'all know what time it is. Like this reaction, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more. As always, the link to the originals will be down in the description box below. If you haven't already, make sure you follow your boy on the gram and Twitter at Artie Kicks. And I will catch you guys in tomorrow night's live stream. See ya! Woo, Mr. Ballin. Good luck on that surgery tomorrow. I hope you pull through. Just fine. Good night, everybody.